So this is the, the first sermon in kind of a, a basic uh, a basic Christianity series. My plan is always, or my general plan is always to kind of do something like this once a year with the idea that every year people add to the church and then that way we, we get a place where we, and they all come from different backgrounds. So it gives us a place where we can talk about, hey, this is why we do this, this is what we believe. So a lot of different faiths will use different words, or the same words, but have wildly different meanings. So when we come to, when we say God, we're not talking about the universe. We're not talking about some something this way. When we say God, we mean this. When we say scriptures, we're not saying anything that anybody has ever considered holy. We mean the Bible. Or when, so we kind of kind of give those those sort of things. So basic Christianity is kind of this. Uh, I like to do it. I like to do it every year. We haven't done it here for about three and a half. So I'm a little overdue. Now, here's the thing. When I look at building something like a basic Christianity series, uh, there's almost two directions I could start out with, and I always, always struggle with which one should be the first one. So do you first start out with talking about God? This is who we say is God. And start out with God, and then say, and God gave us the Bible, and then the next week get the Bible. Or do you start out with the Bible and say, this is the Bible, blah, blah, blah. By the way, the character in the Bible is this person named God, and here's God. And it's one of those things where it's kind of, you're almost both of them need to, to emerge side by side. Uh, I, you, could, you could almost do it three weeks where I'd start out saying, hey, the universe uh, shows the fingerprints of God. Roman, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, Psalm 19, right? The heavens declare the glory of God. So kind of look at, at that. Hey, what do we know about God from our own experience? And start with like that. So this God person would want to talk to you. Therefore, let's look and explore how do you think you talk to him and then find the Bible and then ultimately get to, well, what does this Bible say about God? And then we could do theology that way. But in the interest of time, I'm just going to launch on the Bible. And here's the deal. When we talk about the Bible... Uh, this is a big struggle right here. There's a lot of people that, that spend their whole life studying the Bible that have hugely different opinions. Uh, so as soon as I start talking about what do we believe about the Bible, right there a lot of people start, there may be some words that you've learned uh, in other Bible study classes, and you're like, well, what about this? What infallibility? You have all these words that want to just kind of throw up here because there's been debates about the Bible for thousands of years. And I got to tell you, as geeky as I am, it is entirely possible that I could be here for four or five hours talking about this. But I do know that uh, my child of the Paul verse child has a concert at, had a concert at one, right? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Nick and Paula, if you got a jet, just understand. <laughs> You can take, well, yeah, if you can take Ricky, that'd be good. <laughs> this is good stuff. There's a, there's a million things, and honestly, the more I was digging for prepping for this, I almost want to do, a, you almost could do a series on the Bible, on how we got it, what's in it, and it's all of those things, but really what I, what I figured that we should do is I'm going to start with the end in mind, and that's when it comes to the Bible, our question needs to be this. When, when I look at the Bible, can it be trusted? Can I trust it for matters of faith? And that's what you got to start out with. That's, that's what, you're, what you got to look at. So what we're looking, we're, we're wanting to get to the end of it by what we explore the Bible. At the very end, do we want to we come back and say, well, this document, can we trust it? And really when it comes down to trusting the Bible, there's almost three different large camps you can fall into. One large camp is that, yes, you can trust the Bible. That's the easy one, right? And then there's one that would say, no, there's nothing you can trust in the Bible. It's totally untrustworthy. It was made by broken people. Or there's maybe some middle ground which is really not very tenable. And it's the idea that I can trust it, but to a point. Because the question would be, to what point? Oftentimes it's to the point that I already agree with the Bible. For people that fall into that middle camp, they trust the Bible as far as it lines up with their prejudices. Am I 
my theses is we're going to come down to I can trust the Bible. But let's, let's look at why I, I, I go that way. So starting out, I will tell you this about out the Bible. Um, it is a unique work in history. The reality about the Bible, it is, it's unique. Nothing else like it. Uh, there is no other thing that would be like it. I mean, you could almost, when I try to think about what, what you can almost say maybe the Roman road system or aqueduct system or the, uh, or the, no, not even that. Not even the Great Wall. As a work of, 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 of humanity, it is something that takes centuries. It is centuries to form. The Roman road system was formed within only a couple hundred years. The Great Wall, a couple hundred years. I'm talking about over a thousand years the Bible was formed. That is, that's unique. There are absolutely, <coughs> there are other religious texts out there, but they're done totally different. Other religious texts are done by a single author. And oftentimes the way that, that a, a religious text would, would, would work, would somebody, you would you'd figure that there would be somebody that would come to some epiphany, some, some enlightenment. And they would get to the point of enlightenment, and then they'd write down the enlightened thing. And that's what it is. So from a, from a perfected human, a perfect, the, I, the argument is a perfected human then writes down what being perfect is. It's like the guru. You go up to the top of the mountain, you ask the guru, what is the answer to life? And he knows because he's arrived there. But believe it or not, the Bible's not written that way. It is written by people that are imperfect. It is a perfect work that is honest about the fact that it is perfect, but written by imperfect people. I don't know, um, and I'm a baseball fan, it's possible to go and watch, it is possible, not probable, to go and watch a pitcher throw a perfect game, right? But is that a perfect pitcher? So we know in baseball that you can have a perfect game. You can't, even if you're not, even in perfect people. There can be something that, that is created as perfect. Um, it is a unique work of history. I'll tell you, we'll go more into the specifics of its uniqueness uh, as we're coming here. It's unique, first of all, in its composition. It's creation, the way that it's it's made. It is a work that started, depending on how you reckon it, in the Stone Age. Think about that. The earliest parts of the Bible are written at the, the end of the Stone Age. Is that amazing? The earliest parts come from that far, far ago. It comes from a, the second millennia BC. That's amazing. As you're, as you're reading through it, it's funny. I really, I love reading in the Old Testament. It's, it's funny, though, because you see elements in the Old Testament where they're talking about this, this part of the Bible that, that they talk about the great, the new invention, the great new invention, the brick. It's in Genesis. It's when they're talking about the Tower of Babel. That is what makes it so that they can build the tower. That's why humanity says we're so great, because we invented bricks. That's in the Bible. They talk about uh, how impressive the Egyptians are, because their chariots are, have iron. So they're at a Bronze Age, and suddenly the Egyptians are in the Iron Age. So you go from... You go from Mesolithic to Neolithic to Bronze Age to Iron Age to the Classical Period, completed in the Roman Empire. That's amazing. Worldviews, wildly different worldviews from the very beginning. The first person to put uh, reed to clay. To the person that puts pen to parchment. Wildly different worldviews. But the amazing thing is that all the author, authors, while they're all different, they have a consistent theme. They have a consistent character, God. 
The content is amazing. I think it's important also to see that its dissemination is amazing, unique in history. It is all over the world, even today. It is all over the world. It is smuggled into countries where there is a death sentence for having it today. The amazing thing is that's not, that's not the first time. This book has many times in history been a death sentence to whoever's owned it. Yet it is the most prominent book out there. Isn't that amazing? Throughout time and geograph geographically all over the place. You can find it all over the globe. Now, I always felt uh, I always thought it was interesting because you'll watch a lot of these people, especially a lot of the doctors that have a lot of letters by their name, and they've, they've studied a lot, they've read a lot, and they know a lot, but they don't, they, they've studied their whole life on the Bible, but they don't believe in God. And there's been part of me that goes, well, why would you invest your life in that? Well, i got to tell you, just from a historical thing, I, 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 I see why. If you are a humanist and believe that humanity is the highest form of anything, the Bible is the highest form of work that humanity has ever done. It took us roughly 10 years to get to the moon, right? From, from, from Kennedy saying, hey, let's go to the moon and go there. And that was hard. That was her late uh, 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 Herculean effort, right? But imagine a book that takes a thousand years to make compared to that. Generation on generation. I remember going to Europe and looking at these amazing cathedrals that took hundreds of years to build. And you're like, wow, like three generations spent their life building this cathedral. That's amazing. Thirty generations took, spent their life building the Bible. So here's, here's the thing. I'm going to say things about the Bible that if you turn on the History Channel, they're going to say, I'm an idiot, by the way. Part of the reason... That, uh, that they have, that, that, that folks have, uh, the experts, if you will, are wrong about the Bible. It's because their initial assumptions are wrong. So I said, uh, my initial assumption is I'm looking, hey, maybe I can, this unique work of, of humanity, this unique work in history, this unique work of something may have some trustworthiness. I assume that it's trustworthy. They assume it's not with the idea of looking to find a reason for it not to be. And there's a reason for that. Uh, what they do is they, they look at it with, with the eye of, I, if I can find a little wiggle room, then maybe. Um, if we look in, in um, the Bible, we, we, see, we see this even within the believing community, whereas uh, God tells us to love our neighbor, we say, well, just how much love? Yeah, who is my neighbor? Which, which neighbor? Honestly. And we could say, oh, yeah, that's the, that's the Jewish folks that look for the Ten Commandments after God told them to love their neighbor. And you're like, yeah. Or it's, it's Peter and the other apostles who said, well, how many times do I have to forget? How many times in a day? How far do I have to go before I can give up? What they want is they want, they want wiggle room. We don't want that. The, the, the challenge with the Bible is if it's central assumption that there is a God who created the universe. First verse of the Bible. In the before times, God creates everything. If that right there is true, then he has an ownership on everything that we can never have. And if that is true, then that changes how I'm, I'm not. If he is the God of the universe, I'm not. If he has absolute sovereignty, then I can't have absolute sovereignty. No, no matter how much I want to dress it up with the, the free will bubble or bow, I can't have the same sovereignty God has because he created the universe in Genesis 1-1. So the experts have this problem that if they have to, honestly, if, they, if the supernatural happens, if God intervenes in the universe, then that means that God has a claim on their life. So what the, a lot of the experts will do is they'll have a non-supernatural assumption in the Bible. 
which is they're, they're, they're suspecting that anything that is, is described supernaturally must be natural and just confused. So they make that assumption. If you make that assumption, you're going to, in many ways, they blindly miss things. So for me, this is my common sense when I look at it. I say there are places where prophecy is fulfilled. They say that's easy. Prophecy is fulfilled easily. Prophecy is fulfilled by the guy who writes it after the thing happens. That way, there goes supernatural. I can go back to sleep. There is no God. That's what happens. They, they make that argument. Here's the challenge with that. The challenge with that is I can even look within modern history and say, hey, look, look the, the book of, uh, of Revelation seems to talk about a nation, a Jewish nation in that part of the world. It was written after that nation had been destroyed. And that nation didn't happen again on the face of the earth until 1949. So if I used a non-supernatural read, I would have to then say the date of Revelation, Revelation must have been written after 1949. Does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. But that's what they have to do. In, in, in a way, they, they, they create this thing that they have to just rationalize it. I think about the world before, uh, or the, the idea of how the, how, the, how the planets rotated and the stars rotated around the Earth in Copernicus's time. That they had just all this, like, well, this one just kind of does a figure eight pattern, and this one does all this. They created all this other thing to create these systems because they didn't want to believe the simple thing that maybe the Earth revolved around the sun. And that explained the planets. They didn't want to see that. So they create this situation where it's, it's so hard. I, they assume. This is an assumption. i got to tell you, this is an assumption. That if you go and you read, they will tell you that the Bible was held in oral tradition for hundreds of years and then written down. You will hear that. You will hear that even coming from evangelical professors. Because it is such an echo chamber out there. Here's my problem with that. Primary elements of the story involve writing. In an oral tradition, it makes no sense for Moses to walk down with tablets. The problem is Europeans drove drove the, the thought about everything smart. And we figured that since Europeans, I'm using myself as Europeans, because Europeans were illiterate, the rest of the world must have been illiterate. We forget that the Bible comes from the people that invented writing. Three to four thousand years ago, writing was invented, or uh, sorry, uh, three thousand years BC, five thousand years ago. Five to six thousand years ago, maybe. Writing is invented from the city that Abraham comes from. And we go, yeah, but they're illiterate. Why? Because we were? Because my ancestors were? Because my ancestors were so decorating themselves with animal poop and living in caves? Not everybody was. That's our problem. And there's, there's elements throughout the stories that it's like, write this down. That writing this down, carrying a scroll, is a, is a part of the narrative. If you remove that thread out of the narrative, the narrative doesn't make sense. And then when we look archaeologically, we look back there and we find out that, you know what, those people probably weren't illiterate. We still don't want to say it. Archaeologists still refuse to say it. I'm the one that goes, hey, it doesn't take that much technology to teach writing. You got a stick, you got mud. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. Look, when we see that, that's a mountain. We see this is the sign of this. And we know that people have been doing that. We see tens, tens of thousands of years of scribbling on the sides of, of caves where we're drawing things to represent other things. I don't understand why all of a sudden we're like, yeah, but they couldn't understand writing. They're illiterate. They're not illiterate. 
The reason that we can excavate in Egypt, where, by the way, the Jews were, weren't they prisoners for a while? And they can excavate in the slave pits where the slaves were, and they can pick up a trowel, and the trowel has somebody's name written on it. That means that the slaves could look at that and say, that's Bob's trowel. It doesn't make sense in an illiterate world. The thing that we see, we talk about, have you, have you, how many of you have heard of the pillars of Hammurabi? Have you ever heard about this? Oh, great thing. This is one of those things, a lot of times people outside the Christian tent throw it around because they're like, look, this is the basis for an eye for an eye. So about the time of Abraham, 17, 1800 years BC, this governor in Babylon, this area, Akkadia area, all that kind of uh, fertile crescent area, named Hammurabi. And what he did is he set up a bunch of laws, rules, on rocks, on signposts, and set it at the borders of his country. So when you came in, you, un you understood that if you poked somebody's eye out, your eye would be poked out. If you stole something, your hand was getting cut off. He wrote it down. So that when people walked in and saw the laws, they knew how to obey it. But they were illiterate. Does that make any sense? So this is my part where I, these people that have been in colleges for years are like, no, no, they're illiterate because they had to be. Well, they had to be literate because they want to believe that the Bible is just a series of rumors that were echoed and echoed and echoed and people put in the supernatural because they didn't know. And it started with, oh, you know what? Uh, this, this prophet guy, this one guy that God liked, he got in a chariot and left. And it ends up with a fiery chariot comes down from heavens and takes the guy away. And they say, see, that's what happened. Elijah just left. He took a world <laughs> vacation. That's what they wanted. To, not that Elijah. Yeah, I know. He said, no, I didn't. Although Elijah might have to leave in about five minutes, but we'll see. You don't, you don't need a fiery chariot. You can just... But, but the whole idea that, I mean, that's the, that is the problem. That's the, that's the challenge. As believers, we, we have to look at that. We have to, you know, there's a part where I'm like, the skepticism that they look at the Bible, I just look at their assumptions. The other challenge, and this is an internal one, I'll just throw this out there. I know I just wanted, I'm just getting excited about this. It's not, it's not Every book, like in the Old Testament, is built on other parts of the Old Testament. So there's this echo where all the prophets, all the minor prophets or whoever's writing, is writing with a view of the law. Because they had the law, because they read the law. But what they, what they suggest, and I will tell you this, what they want to say is they want to say that the Bible, the Old Testament isn't compiled until after they come back to the exile and they do that. And they say that because there's some... Um, uh, there's some assembling, there's some composition that happens after they come back from the ex exile. I'll talk about that here in a second, um, right here. Let me tell you this. The argument is that the people that come back from the ex exile insert stuff almost as if it's a uh, counterfeit. But I'll tell you this. The people that came back from the exile that inserted stuff in the Bible, do not do it as a counterfeit. If I did it, if I made a counterfeit, you don't want, I don't want you to know that I did it, right? Okay. So, so this is, by the way, this is to not, that's, I'm going to give you some big words, small words, it's actually three letters, T and K. Uh, the Tanakh is, uh, it's what, the, what the, the, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, uh, Torah is the T, uh, Nivium is the, the prophets, or the, the N, the K is the Ketuvim, which is the writings. You might see it translated in your Bibles as the Law of the Prophets, or the, the Law of the Prophets and the writings. That's what they're looking at. Uh, now, probably the last one is probably written the Chronicles, probably the guy that writes the Chronicles assembles it, and you know what? So here's where some knockdown drag out fights happen. The Torah. First five books, sometimes called the Law, sometimes called the Books of Moses, sometimes called the Pentateuch. There'll be arguments about whether or not Moses wrote that. I will tell you this, Moses did not write everything that we call uh, the, the, the Pentateuch. Part of it is because 
Moses dies before the end. So I will tell you that Joshua, likely Joshua, closes out the Pentateuch. Everything after it says, and, and Moses died, everything after that, Joshua wrote. Let's just say that. But, there are some insertions from later on, but none of them are done in any way that is meant to be counterfeit. So the late insertions you see in the Old Testament is where somebody says, the village was called a Rebbebel or whatever, and they're like, and today we call it Dan. When I say, and today it's, you can call it Dan, does that sound like I want you to think that I'm from them, or I want you to know I'm, I'm just giving it to, I'm giving exposition for clarity. And we do that same practice today. That's what you're going to see. If you look through the, read through the Old Testament, you're going to be surprised now because it will jump out at you. Every time they hear somebody say, and, and they still do that practice today. Or that's just like how they, they still celebrate her death this way. That is just a, that's just one of the, the, the people at the end that are suddenly in the Old Testament that's not, that are just kind of doing that. And, and it has value. It all has, they, they compose it all. That. So it's written, closed out around the 5th century. That's when, the, and today, we call it Dan. We probably don't call it Dan anymore. It's probably not there. Yeah, but uh, and, and, but that's that's it. It was closed out then. That's the Old Testament. When we talk about our Old Testament, now this is a slightly different order than what we have. We have the Septuagint order. Uh, what happened in uh, about three centuries before Jesus? A guy by the name of Alexander the Great conquers uh, everything he can and decides that he wants the whole world to be able to share language, share culture. So he, they translate the uh, what we call the Old Testament now um, into. Uh, from Hebrew into uh, Greek. So we do have the Septuagint. So what Bible did, did Paul use or, or Jesus use? Probably the Septuagint. It was kind of a, a big thing. Partly because where Jesus was from was an area that had a whole lot of Greek people and a whole lot of that sort of stuff. So it would have been the, the common trade language. He spoke Hebrew. He spoke Aramaic. He spoke Greek. We see all those. All those. Um, so that's the, the, the Old Testament. Uh, what we have for the New Testament, um, uh, I will say about the New Testament, uh, the New Testament is, is written and completed within the, the generation of Jesus' death. Uh, last, uh, the last book likely written is uh, Revelation. Time-wise, probably Revelation. Uh, and then it is uh, written by one of the last disciples, John, is, is who it's credited to. And people will say, well, how do we know that we have the right one? Now, let me tell you this. I'm going to use this word. Uh, one of the assumptions that is made by many people that is wrong is that we have the Bible because it was approved. So the question is whether or not the Bible is, is authorized. In other words, its authority is derived by us voting for it or whether or not it's recognized, where we recognize what God did. Most people make the argument, make this the first argument. So they'll say, we don't, we don't know, there's no New Testament until the Council of Nicaea, or the Council of this, or the Council of that, where they approve it. But that's not the case. Uh, in our history, we have, it's the difference between the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, if you want to know. The Declaration of Independence, we declare that we have the right to do this because this is how God created the universe. Everybody has the right to self-governance. That is that idea behind. That is the idea behind the Declaration of Institution and, and, uh, Independence. The Constitution derives its authority from the states who say we're going to gather together and we're going to authorize this. This is how we're going to form a more perfect union. Make sense? Uh, so people will say, hey, we don't have the right, maybe we don't have the right book in the Bibles, or it's all white men that, that they'll, they'll, that's what they'll say. They'll say it was a bunch of white men that chose what the Bible was. Let me tell you this. Uh, no. Were they male? Yeah, probably. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yes to the male, no to the white. The center of the church was the Mediterranean Empire. Uh, this was before the Arabs had wiped out most of the African nations across the top. So it was probably uh, much more brown and black um, than, than white. 
Uh, so, and they didn't vote on what books are. They never thought that they were voting on which ones. They always thought that they were recognizing what God had already done. So part of what they did is they looked and they said, hey, listen, it's hard to get the scripture around. People will die if they have it. Which books win everything? Which books really had a relevance and changed lives? Which books do we absolutely true, uh, know are true? Now, I will tell you that within, uh, so the 300s, we have a couple people that finally wrote the uh, list down. But within the 100s, uh, we have... Uh, writings from people in the 100s, Polycarp, Justin the Martyr, uh, those kind of folks. Uh, and from them, they quote extensively the scripture we have. Uh, I would say that the list, when they finally started making lists, there's only one list that has a book that we don't use. Uh, one guy, one time, uh, Cyr Cyrus or something like that was his name. Billy Ray. Um, and he includes the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, just for a second, although that's pretty widely believed to be a late creation, he only says it once, and then he never brings it up when, they, when he shows up to any of the councils. So he's like, he, he thought it was popular for a day. It's like when everybody's like, oh, have you read this new book? It's really cool. And then they go around and they're like, yeah, no, we don't like that. Thomas was at our church. He never said anything. Like, oh, oh, see you later. The, the books that they debated, just so you know, the books that they debated were... James, Revelation, Hebrews. Those were big ones that they debated. All three we had. Um, there were a couple more that, that, that were also kind of the, the Shepherd of Hermes, the Didache, uh, and some letters from Polycarp were seen as, as really good stuff, but never seen as canon. Um, and we still have those. It's not like they burned them. They didn't start a, a big old bonfire and burn those writings. It didn't happen. So what they did is they recognized these things, and this is the list that we have today. All right, so the Bible, I know this is big. The, the, it really comes down to this. God meddled. God meddled in the universe at the creation. God continues to meddle in the universe through salvation, by the way. And at the end, he will meddle again by the consummation of salvation. But when we talk about this with the Bible, it's the same thing. God meddled in how we got it. He meddles. He continues to meddle in how the Bible endures through history, and ultimately he meddles with it. He does these three words, and we use revelation, inspiration, illumination. How many have heard these words before? Revelation is how he reveals himself. This is a verse from Ezekiel that says, And I will show my greatness, I will reveal myself, and my holiness, and I will make myself known in sight of uh, many nations, and they will know that I am Lord. This is what God is doing. God has chosen to reveal himself through the word. Uh, that's what he does. Uh, it, it is... Uh, we see God's fingerprints in its creation, in its composition. The fact that all of these people from different worldviews and different cultures can be described the same God, even as if they know him, and that that God looked the same through all of those places. I think that's amazing. Um, we see his fingerprints in the endurance. Uh, people thought that there was going to be a lot of movement. 1949 was a big year. Not only was that when uh, Israel uh, did get, become a, a nation again, uh, for the Bible, it also was a big year because that's also when they started finding the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, what they found is, by the way, this illiterate people that just had Ill were illiterate for hundreds of years, they found a library. Interesting, right? With hundreds of fragments. That's interesting, but they're illiterate. Don't worry, nobody read it. And I've been there. I've seen some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're amazing. And the amazingness is the fact that they're, they're very, they're the same books that we have, the same information that we have today. There isn't a big snowball. There hasn't been a big snowball. So we see that, we see that uh, it, it has, it's endured. It endures through persecution. People, uh, even, even though the books would have cost their life, people carried the books around. That idea that God kept people safe, kept it safe. So we see God's uh, fingerprints there, we see God, and we see God's finger, fingerprints on his transformations, whether or not it's, uh, it works. And when we look, we look in, in, in the Bible itself, it tells stories of Paul, who started out murdering Christians, ends up being a, a writer uh, of the scriptures. We have James, also, 
who started out not believing in Jesus. James is one of the brothers of, of Jesus who showed up and said, Jesus, you're crazy. You're talking crazy talk. Come back with us. And then later he ends up being ahead of the church. Think about that. And more than that, we've got other historical figures that have been changed because of the Bible. So when I look and I say, well, is it trustworthy? Well, I see that God's fingerprints are meddling in its creation. I see God's meddling in, in, its, in its kind of enduring. And I see God still working through it uh, throughout history. That implies to me that maybe I can trust it. When I look at what it says about itself, this is a great uh, quote, the instructions of the Lord are perfect, uh, reviving the soul, the decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commands of the Lord are right, bringing joy to uh, the hearts. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Uh, reverence uh, for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey. The honey uh, even the honey uh, dip, uh, look, dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servant, a great reward to those who obey them. This was written 3,000 years ago by illiterate people. Sorry. All right, and then a thousand years later, Peter writes this. He says, we're not making up clever stories when we told you the powerful coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his, uh, magic splendor, uh, his majestic splendor uh, with our own eyes. Uh, when we received honor and glory from the Father, the voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, This is my son, uh, my dearly loved son, who brings me uh, great joy. Our, we ourselves have heard the voice from heaven uh, when we were with him in the Holy Mountain. By the way, he's quoting a gospel. Peter is quoting a gospel as the scripture. Which means he has the gospel. Yes, the gospel is uh, because of that experience, we have great confidence in this message proclaiming to, by the prophet. Uh, we must pay close attention to what they wrote, for their words, like, uh, their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns, uh, the Christ the morning star shines in your hearts above all, that you must recognize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or human initiative. No, prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they spoke from God. Or as, as Paul says, all, all Scripture is God breathed. Uh, right here uh, from 2 Timothy, all Scripture is inspired. God breathed. Uh, by, uh, is inspired by God. Is useful for teach to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong with our our, our lives. It straightens us out and teaches us uh, what to do right. In other words, this inspiration is a uh, this inspiration is, is how God gave us it. And then illumination. He continues to work the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is from Luke. Uh, then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. And this is, a, by the way, a ministry of not only Jesus, it's a ministry of the Holy Spirit that continues. Illumination is when we study the Bible and we're like, we get those epiphanies by the my God. God's still actively meddling. So, how do we know it's trustworthy? Well, we have external evidences that, it's, that God's been meddling and working. We have internal evidences that seem to indicate the same thing. We have also personal testimonies where we look around and see how God has worked. There is, there is some change in other people's life because of interactions with the Bible. So again, when it comes back down to it, is it reasonable to trust uh, in the Bible? And I will say this, back to our assumptions. It is reasonable to trust in the Bible if we believe these two things. One is that God wants to communicate with people. If we believe that God wanted to, did not want to communicate with people, then this would be a silly, this would be a silly thing. If we believe that He wants to communicate, then we should be looking for how He's communicating. The big indicator would be, hey, look for a unique work in history that takes that that moves over millennia, that moves moves over human ages. That would be it. The next one is if He is, and if we believe that God is active in creation. If we believe that he is active in creation, not only in the, the meddling in the universe and creating the universe, but meddling in the universe and the maintaining the universe, then, we, we, then it's reasonable to assume that he's going to be involved in, in the transmission of the message to each human being. What the Bible says. It's a reasonable thing. So absolutely there can be misrepresentations of the Bible or people being wrong in their understanding. That is possible. 
But that's an argument to learn more about the Bible, not less. It is a work that does context is important. That means we should spend more time in the Bible. So coming back to the, the what if, so the so what element of it is therefore this day we need to choose to spend more time in this unique document, in reading. Listen, I know that there is a point where people have said, hey, listen, and I'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, in a few weeks, but people will say, well, this, that's something for a pastor to look at because you're a pastor, you've got to look at the Bible. Well, listen, God's kingdom is organized in such, and I'll make, this, I'll make this argument when I talk about the church in a few weeks. We are a priesthood of believers, every individual in here. If you say, yeah, a priest should know the Bible, I would agree with you and say, and you are that priest. So spend more time in the Bible. Find active ways, join active ways. I know uh, we've got something happening on Thursday here at 2 o'clock, or 12 o'clock, if that doesn't work for you. Dan has a Bible study happening Thursday night set, set, seven. seven. You can even zoom on in. We've got that happening. We'll, and if you want to host something in your house, well, let me know. We'll figure out how to make it happen. Commit to these sort of things. Decide, declare, tell other people so that you can hold yourself accountable to this. Not because it's a New Year's resolution or at the beginning of the year. Oh, let's, let's lose five pounds and read the Bible. Let's read the Bible because God meant the universe to give it to you. So on that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Father God, we thank you for your Son who came into this world. Jesus, we, we thank you for your death on the cross. Holy Spirit, we thank you for continuing to guide prophets, to guide scribes, to, to guide people to transmit and continue to bring the Bible, your word, uh, to us, to carry it through the generations to my house. Lord, I pray that, that you help uh, you, you, you encourage me. You, you wake me from my slumber so that I will, I will point more and more uh, in, in toward uh, learning your scripture, learning about you, so that I can live a life that brings uh, full glory and honor to you, Lord. We thank you for this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. As I send you out, I send you with that message from the Bible, from Numbers chapter 6. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you, that he makes his face to shine upon you, that he's gracious to you and grant you peace. Amen. All right.